Hello everyone and thank you for joining. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm the online media manager for modernanalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled The BA's Friend or Foe, How to Fit Requirements Engineering into Agility. Today's featured speaker is Hans van Luent, consultant and teacher. Today's webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. Please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the GoToWebinar software. There are also handouts available in the GoToWebinar control panel for you to download throughout the session. And now I'd like to say thank you to IREB, International Requirements Engineering Board, for sponsoring today's event. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Stefan Stern to say a few words before we get started. Stefan? Yes, Tracy, thanks a lot. Hi, everybody. My name is Stefan Sturm. I'm the Managing Director of the International Requirements Engineering Board. And you can see our CT CPRE certification scheme. Uh, IREP provides a certification on requirements engineering. It's worldwide accepted. And uh, you can see the highlighted in bold on the right hand side RE at Agile Primer and RE at Agile Advanced Level, which I want to point out, point out, especially today as the talk is about agility and requirements engineering. So that's enough for now for the CBRE scheme. You can uh, check it out on the IREP website. Hans, next slide, please. A few facts about IREP. So IREP is the worldwide uh, accepted expert uh, panel in requirements engineering and the CPSE scheme is very successful over the, all over the world in over 79 countries, 80 countries about. And on the right hand side, you can see the plus points of the CPRE and especially agility is one of the very hot topics currently and Hans will address that. Um, so um, you will get the slides later on. You can read through the bullets as well. Um, and I will hand over to Hans now. Hans, please introduce yourself and um, start your presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for your introduction. Uh, I'm very uh, honored to be here uh, with you tonight, uh, as, as, uh, at least tonight for me, uh, this morning for you, because uh, I'm uh, located in the Netherlands. Um, I am the second chair of the International Requirements Engineering Board, and I'm also a lecturer at the Uni Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Uh, I used to be president of Testnet, who is the Dutch uh, testing community, and nowadays I have my own training bureau that's called Taraxicum in the Netherlands. Uh, we'll go on and talk about the combination uh, or the intertwinement for, uh, from requirements into agility. And let me first start to discuss something about requirements. What is about requirements? Well, requirements are defined in uh, the IEEE standard as a conditional capability needed by a user to solve a problem or achieve an objective. So it's all about a user needing something, who has a problem, who wants to do something. And a requirement is a capability to make this possible. If we look at it uh, from a high reflection level, uh, you could define the scope of requirements engineering as follows. Uh, we talk about a system, a system providing a function to its environment. And the system, uh, the environment poses needs upon the system. And requirements engineering is about investigating the needs, these needs in relation to the intended function. And we do that, uh, oh, sorry. Let me see how, uh, Okay, well, my uh, animations don't work uh, as I expected, but that's no problem. We study in requirements engineering the needs and the function, the intended function and the needs to that. And uh, we do that to design a solution that enable this, will enable this function. And this solution shall then be developed by developers, build the system. Requirements engineering doesn't uh, really uh, invo uh, involve 
thinking about the system. It's only about the needs and the intended function. And the developers are responsible for making a system out of it. In fact, um, for me, requirements engineering is the bridge between business and IT. The business has certain what we call requirements, needs, and the first thing that the requirements engineer uh, has to do is asking why. What is the reason that the business wants something? And translating that into the what of IT. And the requirements are the bridge between the business and the IT. From that what that uh, has been defined or documented by the requirements engineer, this is handed over to the designers who uh, elaborate the how, and then it goes to the system builders, testers, who develop a system that is then given back to the business and implemented there to fulfill these needs, to reach the objectives, to solve the problems. In fact, requirements engineering is about the needs and how to transform it into use. And in the traditional system development approach, it went in this way. First, the needs were analyzed, and this is where we uh, talk about requirements engineering or information anal analysis or, how, or business analysis, whatever you want to call it. The output from the analysis phase is uh, input for the design phase. And from the design phase, we build systems, we test them, we implement them. And then after implementation, the business can use it. In the waterfall uh, situation, this was the normal way of working. But nowadays, mo uh, many uh, projects develop in an agile way. And then it, uh, the, the way of working is, is different. Uh, in fact, for me, the, the most important thing is that um, the analysis phase is spread out throughout the whole development uh, approach, uh, which is then an iterative and incremental way of working in which we design things, build things, test things, design next steps, build other things iteratively until the system is ready for use. But throughout this, this, these, these iterations, analysis keeps on playing a big role. It's, it's like the canvas on which the other steps are attached. And um, if you look at, at, at needs, you can see different perspectives on the requirements. Um, we see business requirements, what the business really needs, the user requirements, how the user wants to work with it, and then this is uh, translated to software requirements, the functionality, the quality, the constraints of the system. And they are all intertwined. They, they well, they, they uh, circle around the idea of needs. And there are different perspectives. And in a traditional development, in a waterfall situation, it, it goes step by step. In the analysis phase, well, this doesn't work here. Oh, yes. In the analysis phase, we concentrate on business requirements. In the design phase, we concentrate on user requirements and do a little bit on uh, software requirements. In the build phase, well, the, there's another addition of software requirements uh, joining that. And uh, well, in the build phase, many additional software requirements are added to the original uh, software requirements that are uh, elaborated in the design phase. And at the end, in the test phase, okay, in the test phase, all these needs, all these requirements are combined and tested. 
and after a successful test, we can implement it. In the agile uh, way of working, this is replaced by this um, iterative proce uh, procedure of design, build, test, design, build, test on the canvas of analysis. And we see in the agile environment that uh, the, the distinction between business requirements and user requirements and software requirements is not that, that strong uh, anymore. It's, it's a, a continuum of the needs that are well intermingled, uh, working together. And throughout the analysis, throughout the iteration, uh, there is a continuous interaction between the, the, the need side and the analysis side. And because of that, because of that, that this is a continuous, uh, well, let me uh, go back a, a step, because this continuous way of working in, in all parts of um, the agile teams, you see in many teams that nobody really feels responsible for the requirements anymore. It's, it's the idea of, yeah, requirements is, is, is the, the core um, or, or the concern of the product owner. And he has to define the product backlog and the quality criteria, etc. And nobody else is really uh, looking at the requirements anymore. <clears throat> and that's not the way I think it should go. And that's where I want to talk with you about some common misunderstandings that I often see in many uh, agile projects that I encounter. And the most, uh, the four uh, most troubling uh, misunderstandings about requirements in agile today are these ones. Upfront is evil, user stories are enough, only work in software counts and documentation is waste. And I want to focus on these four in the next slides. Let's start with upfront is evil. Of course, the agile um, movement um, originated from the, the frustration that uh, large projects always tried to do everything on requirements engineering in, in the first two weeks of a project and then uh, it, they were frozen and the rest of the two years from the project we should work with something that was uh, defined one and a half year uh, ago and that didn't work for us. and that's why we think upfront is evil but in fact upfront is not evil every project has to start with something and, 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 and setting the right direction, going into the right uh, point on the horizon. What is easy, evil is to try to do too much upfront uh, analysis with too much de detail in the, in, the, in the beginning and then freezing it and say, this, this is the truth for the next uh, two years, that won't work. But still, you have to do something about creating an uh, initial product backlog, maybe on a, on a high level, but still, uh, if you don't do a proper upfront uh, definition of the direction of your project, you will walk around in circles and don't, won't get anywhere. So there, and there are many useful techniques to uh, get to this upfront initial product backlog. For instance, try, the product vision board from uh, Rowan Pitcher, who says you need to start with a vision. You have to uh, have an idea on, of your target group. You have to define their needs in, in a broad way. You have to uh, de develop an initial uh, idea of the product that you're going to make, and you have to define the goals that you want to uh, achieve with it. Or another useful one, in my opinion, is uh, Oops, too quick. Impact mapping. Impact mapping from uh, Goiko Atik um, starts from the goal that the system should have and the actors that are needed to reach that goal. Um, impact mapping uh, tells us not to focus on developing output, but to see 
what outcome for the business will be produced and how you can change the behavior of actors by offering them IT uh, support. Uh, well, it's, uh, our time is too limited to uh, discuss this in detail, but I could really advise you to look into these two uh, techniques to start in an, uh, in an uh, agile project and setting the direction for it. The next misunderstanding is this about user stories are enough. We think we can catch everything with simple, uh, straightforward user as a certain role. I want certain functionality so that, so that I can reach a certain goal. But this is too simple. A project should start with some visions and goals, as I uh, told you in the previous slides. And from that, first of all, you create themes, you create epics, you create features. They are much higher level than, than, than user stories. And only if you have this broad idea of what you're going to develop, there, then the user stories come into the picture. And then they can contain enough uh, detail to start the de uh, development phase in which in the sprint backlog these user stories are further refined into tasks for the development team and another problem is user stories that i often encounter is the, the fact that well we want to um to develop a system to support reality but when you start to define them and redefine them in in the user stories then you start cutting uh, them into pieces and you first cut the whole wood into uh, trunks and we call them features and epics and from that we refine them and refine them and refine them until you have the sprint ready user stories but then the complete the the, the, the division on reality is gone you have what we call the the story mulch uh, a, a large bunch of uh, sprint ready user stories but you can't see the, the whole composition anymore. So that you therefore you need more than only user stories. Another, for me, really serious uh, misunderstanding about uh, requirements in agility is the idea that only working software counts. But that's not true. Working software is output, but what the business really needs is outcome change in behavior change in success and for me the, the the projects are there to produce a change not to produce software software is just a means to uh, realize a change and for me the the most important result of any project is an increase in knowledge uh, an, an increase in capabilities of an organization and that's much more than only software and you could, for instance, look at uh, the approaches like design thinking to uh, see that there's more than, than only uh, working software. To, for instance, the design thinking approach starts with a discover and define phase in which you only create a problem definition and a design brief and possible solutions in the development phase. And only in the last phase, you focus on real working software and all the other phases of such an approach are concentrating on knowledge on new knowledge on on innovation software is only an important but still a a minor part of the whole project the last thing that i want to discuss with you is uh, the idea of documentation is waste in in the first years of agility we all thought oh well uh, we don't need any documentation anymore so uh, well we get rid of it and that saves us a lot of trouble well later on we found out that it's not that easy documentation is for me a, a means to bridge time and space <coughs> and it can also serve as a thinking scene <coughs> in which you uh could reduce complexity create insights uh 
facilitate discussion feedback. Waste is when you create generic documentation with no audience for it. And that's what uh, happened in many uh, old, day, old school waterfall projects. They just thought, well, we, we put everything in paper on paper and uh, well, all other uh, people who want to know everything, something later on will find what they need if they look very good. That's not the way uh, an agile project would work. Define your audience and define the needs of that audience, and then you can do. Uh, then, if you then produce documentation, it's very useful. For instance, um, documentation to um, maintain the system later on, or documentation to discuss something about the the uh, requirements or the user uh, interface, etc. So documentation isn't waste. Documentation is useful if you do it right. So um, if we are uh, on that point, we solve these uh, common misunderstandings. Now we can look at the points of engagement. Where does requirements en engineering uh, is, is used in agile uh, iterations? Well, so let's let's have a look here. We have the iteration uh, that is common in uh, in an agile project. You start with a product backlog, and we saw already that there there's something uh, that you have to do to create an initial backlog. And in every iteration, we pull certain items from this backlog that are input for the for the development team for for the agile team anyway that develops product increments. And when these product increments at the end in the product demo are ready, they are reviewed by certain stakeholders who give feedback and they accept the increment or say that something has to be changed or added or whatever, and that's fed into the backlog again, added to the backlog again. And here in this cycle, requirements engineering has uh, quite a number of engagements points. The first one is the initial definition, as I told you already. A backlog doesn't exist from the beginning. You have to create it. And of course, it's the responsibility of the product owner. But usually the product owner is not a business analyst, is not a requirements engineer. He can't do it on his own. He needs assistance, assistance in creating this backlog. Of course, a product owner well has a, has a quite a good idea about the um, the themes, the features that must be in the system, but consequently refining them into sprint ready user stories. That's a profession that you'll have to do, and that's requirements engineering, as far as I'm concerned. The next step is the selection, the selection of um, backup items to uh, put them in, into the next iteration to be developed. You have to understand what is the backlog item. You have to select it carefully. You have to check it for the finish of ready. You have to check whether or not the quality criteria are added to it, etc. That's also for a large uh, portion requirements engineering work. At least uh, a requirements engineer, a business an analyst should be part of the planning uh, session to select these items, of course. Uh, the testers and the developers and the uh, product owner are also involved in it. But, well, without requirements, uh, a thorough understanding of requirements engineering, it's not so easy to do the right selection of backlog items. Well, um, if the backlog item is uh, added to the iteration, the development team starts developing, and that is it, it, during this development, maybe the role of, of uh, requirements engineering is limited. Of course, uh, some um, refinement has to be done in which uh, requirements engineering can do some um, 
it gives some advice and of course some problems are encountered in which uh, things must be changed but usually the team can do the work by themselves but then at the end the product increment is ready and it has to be validated it has to be validated against the backlog item and the decision of how to validate it is all, once again it's something that uh, requirements uh, engineering is involved in. and then the stakeholders give feedback and you have an up update of the backlog once again that is a point of engagement for a requirements engineer let's um okay sorry let's uh, look uh, to these points step by step in the, in the initial uh, defini uh, definition is putting backlog items on the backlog and they are um in the first step there are high level uh, user stories like there are features epics not too detailed high level um an overview of the things that the system should accomplish and you get it from the business by elicitation elicitation is a is a skill that the requirements engineer the business analyst has uh, learned and a product owner if he didn't get the proper training has difficulty with it so uh, of course in an agile setting the product owner is responsible for the backlog items but assistance and advice from analysis and requirements engineering is very important to pick the right ones. So what, what uh, additional role an analyst could do there is, uh, for instance, checking the, the whole uh, backlog for completeness and maintain consistency, traceability, uh, make ensure that this product backlog is a, a, an integral um, set of the ideas that that are the foundation for the whole new system the next step is the selection step and that's about the um, accepting backlog items in the iteration and the main thing to uh, evaluate at this point of time is is the user story that is now uh, uh, put into the uh, iteration is it ready is it realizable so it's about checking the uh, definition of ready and uh, defining the definition of done creating the definition of done and another role of the analyst is making sure that the team that has to develop it has the right knowledge the right uh, background to do the work and if not um, some spikes are needed to uh, find uh, knowledge that is missing to 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 rediscover the things that are still unsure and once again that that's requirements engineering this analysis work in the, the validation step, another point of validation, it's about checking the quality, checking the quality of uh, the product increments against this, these uh, initial uh, backlog items. And you have to decide whether or not you do it upfront by reviewing or at the end by testing or maybe both. And it's it, the, these decisions are very important for the quality. And the, they, you must relate them to complexity and risks and to the, the, the amount of rework if something fails and the amount of detail that uh, must be uh, achieved. And um, an important role of an analyst would be discussing within the team how to validate, how to assure the quality of the increments that we are producing. It can be done by reviews, it can be done by prototyping, it can be done by testing, and usually all these uh, things occur at the same time. But you have to decide where to uh, focus your quality efforts on. And a role of a requirements engineer could be 
doing the reviews, doing the validation, supporting it to the team, or managing it and making sure that it's done. The last uh, point of engagement is the feedback. Of course, if uh, stakeholders, after reviewing and validating the product increments, give feedback, well, you must, maybe, you should uh, update uh, or create new input for the product backlog. And that, that, that's, that needs quite a lot of creativity. And uh, you must have an idea of the impact on the project of doing so. And it uh, relates to size and complexity of the changes. And sometimes it can be done within the team, but sometimes uh, the size or the complexity of the changes is that high that you need to involve the product owner or even the client. And the main role for an analyst, in my uh, idea, in, is then, um, I'll do an impact analysis and uh, maybe uh, do some uh, spikes to uh, gain new knowledge or create extra user stories, etc. So I think um, my you you understand my opinion. There are many uh, steps in which requirements engineering and business analysts can uh, analysis can play an important role in any. Uh, agile development, and it's certainly not uh, a thing that a, common, a normal product owner could do, because he will won't have the training to take all these uh, activities on his shoulders. Well, from that, uh, let's um, draw the conclusion that in my opinion it's not requirements engineering or agile but requirements engineering at agile requirements engineering is just an important step in all um, agile projects and it's not a single initial phase as it used to be in the uh, old waterfall approaches but for me it's a continuous uh, attention point in every step of an iteration because uh, in, in an iteration you also uh, see design you also see building you also see testing and implementing and in all these steps requirements engineering is involved should be consultant should be uh, allowed to uh, give uh, to bring in uh, new ideas and it makes it, at one hand, a professional specialization, because you need skills, you need training, you need experience to do so, but also all team members must have a certain level of knowledge about requirements engineering. Uh, my ideal team is uh, a knowledgeable um, uh, agile team that in which all team members have a certain level of knowledge about requirements engineering and experience, of course, and one or two specialized um, business analysts or requirements engineers to do the proper, uh, to, to do the harder work, that the, the real tough uh, engineering things that really needs training and expertise and, and uh, experience. And that, that, in my opinion, are the, the most successful teams that I see in the in my environment. So for me, it's a teamwork, a team consisting of members who know what requirements engineering is, and one or two specialists that can take the harder uh, parts of it. So for me, I would say requirements engineering is is too important to leave it to the product owner. The product owner cannot do this by himself. It's, it needs more attention than just one uh, guy who is responsible for everything. So that uh, brings me to the end of uh, my talk. Not completely, because I want to show you 
what we call the uh, RE manifesto. Of course, we know, all know the Agile manifesto, but requirements engineering has produced another manifesto, and that's uh, the following one. We value genuine ent empathy and, not or, but and, techniques, models, and templates. We value creative solution designs and comprehensive elicitation. We value in-time elaboration and upfront specification. We value shared understanding and proper documentation. And for us, for, for the requirements engineers, the, the, the factors on the right are basic factors. They must be uh, un, in control, under control. They must be uh, looked after in a proper way. You need techniques, you need models, you need templates, you need elicitation. You have to specify things up front. You have to document them. But to be successful in any project, you need empathy for your users. You need creativity to design solutions. You need to elaborate your user stories in time, not too early, because then you're blocking your project, not too late, because then you're creating, uh, um, well, you're creating uh, defects in, in your system. And the most important thing is shared understanding. The team and the users and the client all must understand what is the common goal that we're working for. So, um, well, that brings me to the end of uh, my uh, talk. And um, I would like uh, to give uh, back to Stefan Sturm, who will conclude something about the um, uh, IREP as an organization. Hans, thanks for, for the talk. And uh, before I um, talk about uh, a few things as well, um, I want to point out that we will have a Q&A right afterwards. So please stay here for the Q&A. You see, uh, yes, Hans, please advance to the next slide. Um, what you see is uh, the slide from the beginning. And uh, the thing I want to point out is that uh, all the things Hans has been working out, you will find here on the right hand side um, in the CPRE, RE at Agile, where we do have a primer on the entry level and an advanced level discussing all these engagement points of requirements engineering uh, into agility in depth. So please check it out. And um, the next thing I want to just to give you a glance what IREP is doing, Hans, the next slide, please, is something we called digital design, um, because we realize that uh, these RE techniques are very much on a, on a technical base and uh, for, for, let's say, um, systems in areas where we know what we do, where we can ask someone, but in the term of industry 4.0, digital transformation, internet of things, we are, there are many areas where we do not know uh, how the solution will look like. It will be developed and, and uh, elaborated and discovered during um, a project or an activity. And therefore we need much more design um, uh, comp competencies in there. So that's something IREP is working on. Is there's a website digitaldesign.org, and you might register for the newsletter. It's not built yet, but it will be finished uh, before the end of the year. And if you register in the newsletter, you will be informed. So that's from my side. Now let's start into the Q and A, please. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you, Hans, for your presentation today. We do have some question, questions, so just a reminder, if you do have questions, please locate the question box and you can type your questions in. Hans, our first question, is it common to use use cases in Agile teams instead of user stories? Oh, uh, I, I would say yes, I think uh, use cases, uh, no, no, yes and no. Um, I, I'm very fond of use cases, but as, as a predecessor of user stories, you could uh, use use cases 
to define in an initial stage the, the, the broad outline of the functionality of a system. And then you can refine it into epics and, and, and further on into sprint ready user stories. So it's not one or another. But I think in a, in a good agile project, you use them both. You start with use cases to uh, get the broad view on how a part of the system should, should work, uh, especially about the functionality that is relevant for a user. And then you can uh, see the scenarios and see uh, use case slices and then refine them into user stories to, uh, that, that, that will be uh, input for the iterations. Thank you, Hans. Our next question uh, and comment. This is great input. Can we hear of any special points of engagement where scaled agile is in use, especially where multiple agile teams have interdependencies of requirements or resources, etc.? Yeah, well, I think that's 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 a tough question. I, I am still um, I, I'm, I'm myself. I'm, I'm also uh, struggling with scaling. I know uh, scaled agile framework is uh, well. It's often used, and for me, it's it's some. It combines the good ideas of the waterfall with uh, the the good ideas of um, agility. But the, the main thing in a skilled agile framework is uh, ha having these release trains arriving at a certain point uh, where you could interchange the, the things that you commonly common use uh, together. And well, um, I think uh, I, I have no, no straightforward solution for it, but I would think, for instance, uh, a, a business analyst that works part-time for several uh, Agile teams would would be uh, beneficial to uh, a scaled uh, approach. And then you could interchange the high-level uh, um, teams and epics uh, in a way that, that all um, teams have the same um, idea or the same uh, uh, focus point on, on, on the horizon uh, where they are aiming it. Could and this may, yeah? may I may I support you here because yeah. I have been discussing such thing uh, recently with somebody and the thing is that all these agile frameworks aim in let's say synchronizing the uh, mm -hmm. several teams so that you uh, share um, information between the independent agile teams and the, in the same way you need to share the requirements parts or the, the business analysis outcome at the sync points where you sync uh -huh. the teams you need to sync them on the requirements as well yeah yeah right that that's what i mean but for instance you uh, referring to the previous question if you work with um, uh, use cases you could for instance uh, say well we have a system that cons uh, consists of several use cases and we could take one use case and give it to one team and another use case and give it to another team and then you only have to manage the interface between these these uh, use cases so well um, i think it it can work and i think um well then you're more talking about um, um uh, the st uh, strategy and, and synchronizing, etc., and uh, the infrastructure. But well, it, it's worthwhile uh, investigating that, and requirements uh, play an important role in it. Thank you, Hans. Our next question How do you navigate through auditing sign offs requirements in this iterative approach? Our auditors require sign off on the requirements, project plan, test plan, etc. Oh, auditors, you mean? Oh, okay. Well, I've been an auditor for quite a long time, uh, but uh, that that was quite a long time ago. Yes, uh, I think it's difficult. Auditors and agile that doesn't go to together to that well, because if you want to audit something, you have to have something solid on documentation that you can check. But that's not there in the agile way. I think um, 
auditors could check on, on a very high level, but not not on, on the user story level. Uh, so, and the idea that you can uh, predict the outcome of a project, well, that's not agile. You, you you only know what the outcome of a project is when you're finished. Thank I you, Hans. Think, yeah, it's it's not a very reassuring uh, uh, <laughs> message, but but I think that's the way it works. Our next question, are there any good methodologies on how to check completeness and track traceability of requirements in huge projects? You know, that's uh, also one, uh, <laughs> one headache. <laughs> huge projects in Agile is also a headache. Uh, well, um, I think the only uh, real way uh, of working is um, uh, reviewing, bringing people together and discussing it. You can work with, with traceability metrics, it says, and if you do a, a proper refinement, uh, then, then you can refine things in an hierarchical way and you can trace how things fit together. And if you split the project in, in parts that are relatively in, independent, it can work, but it's hard work. It's not easy, it's hard work. And you, I, I think, um, you should make somebody responsible for it, uh, otherwise it won't work. Thank you, Hans. Our next question. What type of documentation and how detailed would you suggest to document besides user stories for maintaining a complex business application for the next 20 years? Oh, well, for the next 20 years, that's a nice one. Um, well. I'm particularly fond of a uh, uh, behavior-driven development approach. And that means that, that the, the most um, uh, sustainable uh, requirements are documented as, as uh, acceptance test cases in a given when then format or so. I would uh, suggest you know, uh, for the people who ask this question to look into specification by example and and uh, take up the ideas of living documentation. Um, that, that's really the most sustainable way in which to document a system over uh, some decades. Uh, if you try to freeze it into uh, some kind of database or so, it won't work. Thank you. Now our next question, do you have any specific advice for RE on data analytics projects? Mm. No, sorry, <laughs> I'm not a specialist in data analytics. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not very experienced with it. So I, I, but I don't think it's it's really different. Um, requirements engineering always starts with the the, the uh, combination of needs and and, and function. So. Uh, the most important thing is that you leave the system out. Don't look at the system, look at the needs and look at, uh, at, the, at the functionality. And how to solve it with the system is something that the developers uh, should do. So in that way, I think data analytics projects are uh, IT projects just as any other one. I, I think some uh, data analysts will not uh, uh, agree with me, but I'm sorry, that's, that's my idea. Um, perhaps I can add as well here, um, you might want to check out the RE at Agile Handbook, the study guide. It's available for download on the iREP website in the, in the download section. In the handbook, there is a, a comprehensive uh, advice on how to apply requirements engineering in Agile. So this will you give give you detailed information. So it's not not only dedicated for the, the uh, preparing for the exam for the IREP stuff, but it's, it's just giving hands-on information on how to do requirements engineering in Agile. And there you will find many um, answers to that. So in the download section on irep.org. Yeah, well, uh, I might add to that that. Uh, if, if somebody is uh, interested in how, how uh, 
to do requirements engineering in special uh, situations, I could also advise to take a look at the um, handbook of the advanced uh, level elicitation, because there we talk about certain patterns in, in which you can apply uh, elicitation uh, techniques in different environments. And it might come in hand also uh, if you're struggling with these questions. Thank you. Our next question. What is your opinion about event storming as a technique of requirements elicitation and knowledge sharing? Ooh. Um, to be honest, I have no experience with this technique, so uh, I couldn't say a, a real um, underpinned opinion about it. But as I interpret it, I think it's useful. That's the only thing that I could say about it. Thank you, Sorry. Hans. I know we're throwing a lot of questions at you right now. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, oh, and a comment, that was a wonderful point in the beginning of the presentation about targeting the right audience when creating documentation. Mm -hmm. Oh, this yeah. That's Two-parter, this sometimes seems to be the problem in my company. Can you recommend further reading on this? Uh, well, I, I once again would refer to our uh, handbook of elicitation, advanced level, where we treat this uh, uh, in quite a lot of detail. But, um, well, common uh, knowledge is also uh, important. Just. It, try to imagine that you're uh, the audience and what do you want to read? That, that's the important question. And try to um, think of the, the use that people will, will have with your, your documentation. Why do they need it? Where will they use it for? If you can answer this question, you can write a, a proper documentation. Thank you. Our next question. What are the most common conflicts between the PO and the requirements engineer in an agile team when they have different levels of RE competencies? Um, so in my opinion, the, the, the most common conflicts, well, I, I try to avoid conflicts, of course, but um, I rather often see POs who, um, overlook complexity who think that things are simple who um, uh, for instance uh, don't think of uh, additional quality requirements who are not very interested in uh, accepted criteria and, and so on who only focus on the, the the main functionality and say oh it's easy this is the main functionality just make it and while a business analyst then comes with the exceptions, comes with the nitty gritty details, etc. And then, um, well, the, the, the product owner will see, oh, delay and delay and still uh, no functionality delivered. Uh, while the business analyst will say, uh, say yeah, but you, if you want to deliver quality, you have to bring in that. And well, the only way to overcome this is to uh, show, show, don't tell, uh, let's make, make visible uh, how uh, things work and why, for instance, certain quality criteria are important. And then you'll be able to convince your product owner. Thank you, Hans. And I think you have a contact slide, uh, your next slide. So let's pull that up soon. While you're doing that, I'll also ask you your next question. What documents are common to have during the project for BA or product owner? Except um, backlog and burn down charts, or do I depend on a project? Uh, once again, this question, because I didn't uh, completely understand it. My apologies. What documents are common to have during the project for BA or the product owner? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. You have, yeah, documents, well, documents, you, you have your a product backlog, you have your architecture, I think, your maybe your technical architecture, your uh, logical architecture. Uh, of course, you have the down charge, but, well, that's more the product owner than the business analyst who is concerned with that. Um, 
Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm very influenced by these ideas uh, like uh, impact making, etc., and, and the product vision, etc. These are some cornerstones of your project that uh, should be um, maintained, that should be living during the project, because you start with a certain vision, you start with a certain impact map, but, well, you don't know at the beginning what you don't know, so you encounter new things and you'll have to maintain them. You have to keep them as, as living documents. And I think for me as a business analyst, these are the most important documents uh, or a goal tree to, and, and, uh, and, and what, what we already discussed, uh, a set of uh, use cases to uh, define the, the main uh, functionality. So I, uh, if I work in an Azure product, uh, I have quite a lot of documentation with me, but mostly it's, it's my own documentation that I need to oversee the complexity of the project. Thank you. Our next question. How do you deal with changes, updates on Epic feature level during or after a project to keep documents up to date and also for maintenance phase? Yeah, well, um, the Agile theory says that you you don't update your user stories, uh, at least not when they're finished. Um, I I might not completely agree with that, but as I told you before, for me the living documentation in the in the form of uh, given when then uh, exception test cases is the most sustainable way to uh, to update your documents and to produce something that that can be used in the next uh, years of maintenance thank you our next question which tool for requirement traceability would you suggest or approach if you if no tools come to your mind well i am not a tool guy so i i wouldn't know uh, but um i think many of the the common uh, tool suites that are used during, uh, in, in development projects, especially when you're tool-driven like uh, CI, CD projects, I think they, they have enough functionality to uh, trace uh, requirements and to, uh, to keep them alive. So I, I think there are enough tools. Do you want to add something to that, Stefan? Yeah, there, there are plenty of uh, dedicated RE tools out there. Of course, the, 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 the heavyweight one is stores from IBM, which is really a very comprehensive tool. But there are um, many other uh, dedicated RE tools, and they all support traceability there. And um, so this is, um, um, of course, the, the, the way which is perfectly suited for that. Uh, there are other ways of uh, simply implementing it uh, with doc, um, um, office um, uh, tools. Um, I know that uh, plenty of people are doing that, but then you need to build your own traceability by um, IDs, hyperlinks, and so on and so forth. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, such uh, tools like uh, Confluence and Jira can be used where, where people can uh, link um, to other uh, documents. But then you need to implement your own way of traceability and all these RE tools, they have built in traceability tools. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for just, we can squeeze one more question in. Is the RE manifesto actually included in the IREB currently? Uh, no, no. It's it's something that we um, what we show in, in our presentations, but it's not part of uh, our formal, um, formal education scheme. Um, we might consider to include it in uh, in future updates of our foundation level, but it's not decided yet. And thank you. We are just coming up on the top of the hour. So thank you for everyone that posed their questions today. And thanks for Hans for such a great session. We'd also like to thank IREB International Requirements Engineering Board for sponsoring today's event. Thanks for all that attended the Modern Analyst webinar. And I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at the modernanalyst.com website within a few business days. That's also going to include the recording of today's session. And this concludes today's event. Everyone, I hope you have a great day. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.